I do. I'm the toughest guy. Boston strong, baby. Let's go! Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Charles Boston Strong Rosa. Welcome to UFC Unfiltered. Matt and I are still on Skype gazing at each other. Uh, we have Dan Hardy today. We haven't talked to Dan in a long time, and Charles Rosa is calling in as per Matt's request. Uh, we talked to Bryce Mitchell, and they are uh, they're fighting on this May 9th card, and we had requested, Matt had demanded that we get Charles Rosa on the show. And Matt, when you demand something, they jump. I was going to say, Jimmy, uh, you said I, you know, I was asking about it. I didn't ask. No. I did not ask. I said, not. get Charles Rosa on the next on the next show, and bang, here he is. Yeah. I made it. I made it here at the Sarah household. Well, not the whole household, with me. Sure. On my laptop, I made it a Charles uh, Rosa morning, and you I did. watched three of his fights. Yeah, well, I liked his last fight with Manny Bermudez. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, I remember he fought Kyle uh, Bakniak, Bakniak back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Let me watch that. That was fun. And then I watched his fight with Yair Rodriguez, which was off the hook, man. That was a close yeah. ass fight. That was a close fight. And and uh, you know, again, that was a few years back. I'd have to see how many. Maybe like maybe like am I gonna say five years ago? Or is that is that too I think that's a little long. Um I, but then I again, he was out for a while. How long was he out for? He was I'm out gonna for tell you right now. two years. Was wasn't he out for uh let me see. He, he took a, a hiatus How for a while. I might be off with that. Uh, when did he fight Yair Rodriguez? I'll Guys, tell you right now. That was, oh, you know what, Matt? You're, 2015. You're right. I'm looking at it right now. You're correct. It's five How? years ago. It just doesn't seem that long ago. Come on, man. You're right. Why do I give I give myself a lot of credit, but I literally just watched the show. I was not the fight. So I knew it was around that. I don't remember the date on it, but that's good. It was five years ago. It's amazing, man. Like, uh, so, this, I mean, Rose has been around. And he's got a lot of experience, but Bryce Mitchell is, uh, you know what he reminds me of? If, let's say if like uh, Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn became an MMA yeah. fighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't he? Can't you picture him with the straw, like a little Tom Sawyer guy? Bryce well, is funny because he's so polite. Until he starts, until he talks about fighting, he's like, well, yes, sir, I sure do enjoy fighting. But then I heard that piece of shit say something about me, and I'm going to choke him until he dies. It's funny to watch him get pissed oh, off because he's such a nice dude. He says it just like that. He's like, it reminds me, I can't do the accent. I can't even pretend to do the accent. It would be embarrassing and cringy. But he did say that it reminds me when he was on the bus getting like yeah. bullied or something, right? Yeah, dude, yeah. that stuff stays with you. Yeah, he, he doesn't like that at all. It feels like bullying, and he's one of those guys who does. I mean, nobody likes bullying unless you're a bully, but he did. He just does not take well to someone talking shit like that. You know what's strange about that, Jimmy? And uh, it's not good bullying. Should, I don't. I hate bullies. I hate them. But yeah. part of it is because when I was in seventh grade, I used to get fucked with, and I used to get bullied uh, a little bit, and it definitely stuck with me. To and it, it, sure, it got me to the point where I hate it so much. That it made me into like, you know, I mean, listen, you say sometimes you say that all oh, heroes don't wear capes and I'm kind of like a little superhero. If I see something wrong and I step in. Sure. You know, Jimmy, you never said that. I have. But I've but I've, I've implied that, it. OK, you did it. Like when you say it, I'll always go. Yeah. Like so that kind of is like me saying it. <laughs> well, part of my hatred for bullies is because I was fucked with. So the point is it like my it, let's say I never I was never fucked with. Yeah, I mean it's not it's not as good for the anybody I come in contact with because I am a gentle alpha and I look out for the weak. That's Jimmy. right. I mean, I, would I be that same guy if I did not get fucked with Jimmy? Deep, I know it's a deep question for the beginning of the show. You might not. I mean, it makes a hey, like look. I mean, I do comedy because that was my way of not getting beaten up. I was funny. It was my way of getting girls to talk to me because I was. it was the only thing I had going for me. So a lot of guys who learn to fight do it because you're getting your ass kicked and, hey, I'm going to respond by fighting. I just didn't – I wasn't tough enough to fight, and uh, I figured I could make an asshole out of myself and get the same response, which is to be left alone. You took up comedy and I took up – the defensive arts. Yeah, I would prefer to take the defensive art. If I could go back and redo it again, I would just learn to fight and do jokes. I would do both. I mean, I keep thinking, hey. man, I could have 
started in 1991 when I started, uh, 1990 when I started comedy, and God, I'd be really good by now. But you know what they say, Jimmy? What? Something. Well, I forgot the exact saying, so I don't, so I don't know what they say. But they do. They know it's you. It's never too late. That's they say they, that, but they're lying. They don't say that. Yeah, they and, do. And it is true because you, as as you know, I found out. You didn't really tell me. Uh, you trained with the great Jimmy Rivera at Tiger yes. Shoals in New That's York. Right. And you were just just coming into just really just starting to really love it. That's okay. Yeah, it, I'll go back. It gets, well, all right. Maybe I'm overselling it. No, I'm saying I'll go back as soon as soon as we can. Uh, Lyman Good uh, tested positive for COVID too, uh, but I hadn't gone to that one. That was on the west side, and I imagine well, some fighters are going to pop up with it. It's you know, it, it is what it is. It's, it's you know, doing well from what I heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure he's going to be fine. His immune system is probably great. He's very healthy. Um, but I'm still going to go back. It's not going to stop me from going and training. Um, even if I was in that gym, I'd still go back. But you you said that you went to comedy to, with the whole bullying thing, and it got you out of you know it, it kept you from getting bullied, and you should have yeah. did the the martial arts. You you're late to the game to the martial arts, but you did get to it. So that listen, you never know. Not that you're looking for trouble, but you right. never know what what could happen in the future, Jimmy. It's a yeah. Great world, you know me. I'm late to the game with the jokes. And I nah, you always had the jokes. Oh, Jimmy, could you be my sensei? Maybe <laughs> with your the whole comedy, comedy sensei. Thing? Please, Jimmy. Jimmy, I'll be your Padawan. That's nothing freaky. That's from the Jedi and is the Jet is the Jedi, and then there's the Padawan. And oh. the Padawan is like the apprentice. Oh, I don't know what that, I never heard of that. Well, maybe you should watch a fucking Star Wars or two. I'm Jimmy. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not the way. Uh, this is this is the way. This is the way. You know what that is? Um, Star the Trek. Mandalorian. Oh, that you do not watch because you. I'm not saying you're too cool, but you don't give it a shot. Your buddy Bill Burr was. You know what I've been doing, Jimmy? I've been watching shit I like because there's only so much new shit. Sure. And uh, I, when I want to play it safe, I put on some episodes of The Mandalorian, and one in particular I like. One episode is I forgot the name of it, but it's what. Your buddy Bill Burr in it. Yeah, I hear he's it, great in it. It's like a heist. Like uh, they have to go rescue a, um, a, a, you know, a, a criminal that's uh, that's uh, in a prison. So they got to break him out of prison. That's well, it's cool, man. You and Jimmy, if you watch that one episode, you go, you know what? This is fucking cool. Maybe yeah, you won't baby say. Baby Yoda like would show up. Baby Yoda would show up. Mm. Ugh. Yeah, you don't see that. yeah, Got my that's fucking Yoda. ears. And it's not the it, they say baby Yoda, but you know it's not actually Yoda. Oh, I thought it was. Well, then, well, this is to see, you know, that is not the way. Oh. They say this is the way. That's the Mandalorian's creed. Oh, okay. Why don't you watch Star Trek? <sighs> Come on, you can live long. Okay, and I, am, I, <laughs> I can never do that fucking thing with the fucking. I that, can't either. I, I can't. I have to cheat and and take one and old, open it like that. It's awful. I I never liked the Star Trek. Even their phases I thought was stupid. Give them a regular fucking handgun. They got those little fucking remote controls they're shooting each other with. Go fuck yourself. But it's a, it's a foreseeable future, though. Hey, hey, some people like Spock. Some people like Chewbacca. You understand? A lot of people don't like both. I'm no, just, but Chewbacca was kind of stupid compared to Spock. Spock was at least bright. That's well, not Spock, logical, Captain. Chewbacca is like... Rrr. Spock was kind of cool. All right, I'm not lying. Spock, I, yeah. you know, little human, little Vulcan. I understand. Spock you know? makes noise. But that means to make Spock, a human had to, to F a Vulcan, a girl. Who's, I don't know who was which. I forgot. I don't, I know don't the, remember. I've heard the story and I blocked it out immediately. How, listen, uh, how do you think a Vulcan is in bed? They show no emotion. Tireless. They exactly. No emotion. They might be like efficient. Yeah. I'm coming. <laughs> Why did you stop moving? I came all over the place. No, Boy, you? was it good. Holy shit, I'm lighted. You got to stop with that. <laughs> yeah, I imagine they're not very good in bed. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right, let's get off. Because right, a Vulcan cannot be good in bed. There's no way. No, they're Vulcan, probably very good. They're yeah, just not emotional. Yeah, but that's a lot of it, you know? No. What? No? The physical. No, they no just conscious. probably get in there and pump away. So anyway, we got Dan Hardy on the show. <laughs> yeah, we do. Dude, he fucking killed me. Hey, man, how you doing? Hey, what's up, guys? What's oh, up? Charles, what's up, man? My man. I'm so happy to talk to you. 
Uh, thanks, man. I'm also happy to talk to you. I'm a huge fan of yours, man. Ah, you're the best. Uh, listen, I was just talking to your coach slash sensei, yep. Charles McCarthy. Yep. Uh, yeah, I just left him. I was just training with him. So, yep. how, you know, how close are you? You know, how close are you with Charles McCarthy? Has he been through your with you your whole career or part of your career or? Yeah, yeah, my entire career. I moved down to Florida when I was 22 years old and. I uh, actually accidentally I was looking for a boxing gym and I rode my bike into it. At the time, I didn't have a car when I mo first moved down here. I uh, accidentally rode my bike, but I thought it was a boxing gym, but it was Charles McCarthy's American Top Team in Boca Raton, Florida. And uh, man, the rest is history. I, you know, fell in love with it that day. Why Florida? Uh, you know, I'm like like pretty much after college. Like I, you know, I had a lot of struggles, man. You know, I lost uh, my two older brothers, Dominic and Vincent, when I was 16 and 17 years old. I lost them to accidental drug overdoses. So oh, oh. after that, man, like you know, life was tough. I, you know, I was able to graduate college. I graduated from college with a degree in culinary arts as a chef, and then I moved to Florida. Um, you know, kind of get a fresh start. You know what I'm saying? Because like you know, Boston, the life was tough for me. You know, tough people around me. So I just wanted a fresh start, and you know, luckily I did that. I was able to get a job as a chef. But, you know, being a chef wasn't cutting it for me. Um, you know, after playing hockey my whole life and I was competitive, I needed something else. I was, and there's no hockey in Florida, so I was missing that. And, uh, you know, I, I figured I'd pick up boxing because my Uncle Tommy was a boxer, Tom the Bomb Rosa. And, uh, you know, I, I rode my bike into a gym, American Top Team, uh, in Boca Raton. I met Charles McCarthy, and ever since then, man, the rest is history. And he's been my mentor since. That is amazing. I, I, cause I, I love uh, Ricardo Laborio because he's under – Charles is under Ricardo? Ricardo? Yeah, Charles is a black belt under Ricardo Laborio. I actually got my black belt under Ricardo Laborio. Charles McCarthy was right next to him when we gave it, so I, I say I have a black belt under Charles McCarthy, Ricardo Laborio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and it's, you know, the two of the best, man. Yeah, you know, and, for, and for people that don't know, Charles McCarthy was on season four with me of yeah. The Ultimate Fighter. So I spent a lot of time with Charles. And on The Ultimate Fighter, you know, the, you, as people know, like there's nothing to do. So you're just hanging out with the guys. There's no TV. There's no outlet. You can't leave. So I spent six weeks with Charles. So even if I don't talk to the guy for a while, which I just spoke to him the other day, uh, when we see each other, it's almost like, I don't know, you did, you, you just ex yeah, you went through that experience with each other, you know? So when I see you guys, I, I ran into you guys in Boston uh, yeah. when you had your uh, when you had your win. Uh, yeah. That was, yeah. That was with your Manny, with the fight with Manny, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was a big one for me. Performance tonight, first round on boss. So I was, I was super pumped, and uh, you know, to have him, you know, with me there. Obviously, it was, it was a real special night. You know, now, you looked like you were sorry, man. You looked like you were in a lot of trouble in that fight too. At one, at one point, I mean, you were, you're so dangerous off your back. Uh, I mean, he was dropping elbows, and it looked like you kept going for the arm, and he kept pulling free. Uh, were you, did you know you were going to wind up securing that? Because right before you you uh, you grabbed them, they're saying, "Well, he's got to put his uh, legs around the waist," like they were kind of saying that you yeah. should be trying to get out and push off as as opposed to uh, wrapping your legs around his neck. Yeah, Daniel Cormier called me after and apologized for that. He's like, "Man, I'm sorry about that." <laughs> he's talking trash, you know. He's talking trash, and I was like, "Well, man, it's just because you don't know jujitsu." You know what I'm saying? You're a wrestler, but he said, "We, you know, we had a good laugh about it." I was just messing with him, but. Nah, man, you know, I mean, obviously it's not why, where you want to start the fight off. You know, I, you know, I threw a kick and I, you know, missed it a little bit, traveled up his hip. And, you know, when you catch the, the foot on the hip and you get kind of tree topped and I was on my back and yeah, man, man, he's a beast. I mean, he's, he was really, obviously it's the beginning of the fight, beginning of the round. He has all of his strength. He had my back up against the cage, but man, that's like my, my best position. If someone puts me on their back in the gym, they get submitted and everybody knows that. So um, you know, that's, I mean, you can ask any of my training partners. So, I mean, that's that, you know, that's what it is. I mean, I definitely don't ever put myself on my back. Don't want to be there. Charles McCarthy freaks out and yells at me and tells me to get off my back. He'll, you know, he's like, you do that. You know, he'll, you know, that's, that, that's not anything I try to put in my game. No, it's always last resort stuff. So that was my last resort, man. You know, I was, I was, I was eating elbows, so I had to go for it. Now that was a verbal tap. Now, did you yeah. feel it? Did you feel it pop? I mean, a lot of times there's like at least four no, pops before no, it's that's done. The thing is, it didn't even. It, it didn't. I, I mean, I've popped. I, almost every UFC fight, I've popped something on somebody. I mean, I sure. fought Dennis Seaver. I popped his knee. He fought right through it. Uh, you know, I fought. You know, Sean Soriano popped his arm. He fought through it. I ended up choking him out later. But uh, even Yair Rodriguez, I've had him a couple moves and was able to pop some stuff. But nobody taps. And then him, I just boom, I locked it on. And I actually asked them. I got even a video on my phone because I think someone was recording. And they sent it to me later, a fan or something. But I'm like, man, like, I didn't even feel you tap. Like, what was it? He's like, man, that was just so deep that I felt your cuff, like, right under my elbow. And he goes, my arm would have broken half. He goes, so I just I just screamed and all that. You know, I asked him because I was curious. I'm like, that was pretty quick, you know, and it's what it is.
It looked quick, but maybe he's been there before. Maybe he's had his elbow pop before. Maybe it was just a reaction. Ah, yeah. you know. Yeah, you see Anthony Pettis and Henderson. That kind of was like that. You see that fight when he tapped. I think it was Benson Henderson uh, Pettis. Was they that fought? A, they fought a couple of times, though. Yeah, he armbarred think- him one time, didn't he? Or, or maybe Pettis armbarred somebody else. But it was. I just remember like they tapped real quick, and it's just part of what it is, you know. You know, part of the reason why I'm really excited about your fight with Bryce Mitchell is you guys both show tremendous uh, composure under really shitty circumstances. That yeah. fight with Yair mm-hmm. Rodriguez was a bond burner, and yeah. uh, it basically started with you in a triangle. I mean, right away yeah. he got – it was – it's almost, it's one of those things where there's fights, there's certain fights where it's like something goes wrong and it's almost like starting from the shittiest position. So yeah. uh, I remember a Uriah Faber fight where he, he, the guy he went for something and the guy ended up just mounted a great jiu-jitsu guy. He ended up getting out and winning. But it's something similar to that. You were in a tight triangle. It yeah. wasn't close – how uh, you kept your elbow on the proper side of the hip? Yep. If it went across, yep. it's usually night it lights out. How tight was that triangle, and what were you thinking? That was your first. Correct me. Yeah. Was that your first UFC fight? No, no your no, second. My third. No, it was my third UFC. I'm way off. My first, my, my first so, UFC fight was on four days' notice against number yes. ten ranked Dennis Seaver. So I, I flew across the country to fight. That him. was your first UFC was, fight. Was a Seaver fight? Yeah, it was, he was he was number oh. ten in the world, and I fought fight of the night against him. It was a badass fight. If you watch that, I don't know if you've seen that, but it was fight of the night. That's like one of my favorite. And then I went back, submitted Sean Soriano, came from there, fought Yair Rodriguez, lost this bullshit split decision to him. I mean, I thought I I thought I whooped his ass. I was finishing the fight, elbowing him in the face, and it's you know up against the cage. But you know it is what it is. Split decision, lost him fighting in his hometown, Mexico City. Come back, uh, you know, uh, thirty twenty seven, Kyle Boschniak. Uh, one of the toughest kids I ever fought in my life. The kid's a fucking monster. You should see when he fought uh, Zabit. You know, uh, his, his, I point that out a lot. His nails, dude. I was hitting him with everything. His face was destroyed. His leg was black and blue. But and then you know, I I came back against Shane Burgos, and I was up two rounds to none against him. He caught me with a good shot. I was on my feet, swinging back, and the ref. I thought the ref prematurely jumped in. I mean, I I was there the second he grabbed me. I was like, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" So I don't like to make excuses or nothing like that. And, and I mean, also, that was fight of the night. So my three losses in the UFC are all fight of the night bonuses. I've never had a bad performance. I always go out there and perform. And a little bit of bad luck. And I think the time is going to turn, you know, where, you know, maybe the ref doesn't jump in early in the fight. I mean, that's how Frankie Edgar became one of the greatest fighters of all time is because they didn't stop the fight against Maynard, you know. And right. it's, uh, it sucks. You know, I didn't get that, that luck of the draw. But I don't make excuses. I'm, I just go out there and I do the best I can. And I, I, I perform every time. You know, I lo- I'm sorry, Jimmy. I okay. watched, uh, even this morning, I watched three of the fights. And that Yair R- Rodriguez fight, shit, man. Dude, I mean, that was a fucking brutal. I mean, I, I could see where you could have a problem with that decision. You know what yeah, I mean? It depends how you score. If you like that, if you like top control on the ground, if you like, yeah. if you think elbows and strikes are more effective than, you know, little jabs and, you know, inside kicks or what, you know, it depends what you think, you know. But why? I, I, one of the reasons I wanted you on here. Uh, is because if you look at your record, and there's a lot of, and this is true to MMA, because a lot of records, Jimmy here, uh, it, like his record is three and three in the UFC, correct? Right. Yeah, three and three in the UFC. It, yeah. You don't seem like a five hundred, a bat five hundred fighter here. Like you don't, you don't, you should be talked about more because of these losses. Ha, Ten days notice with Dennis, Dennis Siever. Uh, four days. And, notice. Oh, well, what the fuck Four. am I saying? I'm, dude, I'm awful. But uh, short notice, very <laughs> short notice. No, do you have a camp at all? Were you training for anything? Uh, I mean, I'm always training. There's never a time yeah. training. I mean, I don't think I've, you know, besides being injured, I'm I'm always in training, you know, working hard, stuff like that. But, yeah, I mean, it was uh, the only thing that was tough about that, I had to cut 33 pounds in four days, but I, I made it. And luckily I did because I wouldn't have got performance. I wouldn't have got fight of the night and bonus if I didn't make the weight. So, it was, you know. Now, yeah, now Bryce Mitchell, you know, people are talking about Bryce, you know, yeah. for what it is. Yeah. So, I mean, Bryce, is first of all, and, and rightfully so for the kid, you know what I mean? He's he's a, a tough-ass kid, a likable kid, and uh, he pulled off that twister, which got a lot yeah. – I mean, that spiked up his popularity, which he was already on people's radar. Yes, mission of the year, yeah. yeah. So now, with this, you're looking at him. What is it you want – and I always get the shine and the shade. You don't want the shade. The shade's bad. You want the shine. You want the smoke. Somebody, somebody, although Charles, I fuck this up all the time. Somebody DM'd me. A guy DM'd me. He goes, hey, Matt, man, I got to help you out with the whole shade and the smoke thing. Yeah, so I'm yeah. going to read that. Yeah. But you don't want to be talked about taking out Bryce Mitchell. Is this the fight? Is this the coming out party for the fans? We already know you. But the, yeah. for everybody, is this yeah, the coming I mean, out the whole, party now? 
Yeah, I mean, the whole world doesn't know who I am now. They're definitely going to know, you know, um, after my fight May 9th. I don't think there's any doubt in that. I mean, I, you know, I had an amazing performance in my last fight, first round on bar for, over a top guy that I was the underdog against. Everyone said he had Manny Bermudez had the best jiu-jitsu in the world. And then, you know, this, this Bryce Mitchell fight. Yeah, the kid's a young, young super talented, hungry, undefeated kid coming in 3-0 you know, in the UFC, coming off submission of the year. Um, and, man, these are the guys that I want. I want the top guys. I want to be fighting the best guys in the world. I've already fought all the best. You know, I've already fought three top ten guys in my career. And those are you watch all those fights. They're all fighting tonight. They're all fucking wars, you know. So I know where my level's at. But that was also three or four years ago. You know, I'm a, I didn't start in this game. To, like I said, when I came into Charles McCarthy's gym, I was 23 years old. I was a hockey player. I was just, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I was just a kid. I didn't have any former background with martial arts. Just an athlete playing hockey. Tough kid. Got in a lot of fights and hockey games and stuff like that. But, man, my skill level... Like, I think about myself coming to the UFC four years ago with Dennis Seaver, and I think of myself now, and it's a completely different animal. And, you know, that's, that, that, you know, that's, that, that's the facts behind it. So I'm excited. I think this is where I should have been when I got in the UFC, like at this level, and I would have went right to the title. And that's where I'm at now. You really got Bryce upset, too, because he, he, we had him on, and he said, yeah, we had already signed for the fight. We were all good. And then he's saying he's going to break my arm off and fuck it. He was really fuming. Uh, so you, you really pissed him off if that was your intention. Yeah, man. Well, what's gonna happen? I'm not his friend coming into this fight. He's gonna get his arm broken. So, you know, I, you know, I wrote a comment like someone said, oh yeah, and he, you know, you better get some, you know, Reebok camo shorts or something. And I said you better get him a camo sling too, because he's gonna need that after I break his arm. And that's, you know, how I feel. I mean, this is war for me. I'm not going in there to be his friend. I mean, after you know, if the fight earns my respect. After the fight's over, it's one thing. But as far as what it is right now, man, I mean, I'm, I'm going there to take his head off. I'm sure he's gonna be doing mine and. uh you know, there's no love between me and him right now. And, you know, I don't have any respect towards him right now until, you know, he earns it. And he has. Do you, need, do you need that going into a fight? Like some guys need to dislike somebody and some guys like, you know, Sam Alvey doesn't care. He could fight his brother. Like some guys just don't give a shit and some guys need a little animosity. Yeah. I mean, I, I need something, you know, I sometimes everyone always asks me like, why do you look so mean you go in there? And it's because, man, I mean, I, I am willing to die when I go in the octagon. Some everyone has a different thing, but when I step in that octagon, like it's it's. I, I mean, I'm willing to die in there. So when I step foot in there, it's war for me, and uh, that's how I have to think about it. And that's that's how I go into it, you know. And maybe that's the reason. So people say, oh, so you're not scared or something like that. But that's my way of going in there, and that's how I walk in there with with supreme confidence. And let me tell you, Jimmy, I want you to after this interview, we're talking. See how nice and polite this kid is, you know. Yep. What? Watch his walkout in Mexico City uh, versus Yaya Rodriguez. Holy shit, Jimmy. You think I get hyped up on my espresso? I love Charles. And the fight lived up to that fucking walkout. Because sometimes guys walk out and they're fucking, and it's like, oh, this is going to be great. And then it's a dud. Dude, the fight lived up to the walkout, and the walkout got me fired up. Like, so what was the feeling walking out with Yaya Rodriguez? I know it was five years ago. Dude, but shit, was- dude, you were in the zone, man. How are you feeling with that? That was a crazy one, man. I remember I had the American flag because we're in Mexico City, of course. So there's 30,000 Mexican fans, you know, cheering against me. So, uh, yeah, there's 30,000 fans cheering against me. We're standing under the tunnel. And I remember Charles McCarthy is next to me in the tunnel. And I, some, some, some Mexican guys tried to pour beer. They poured beer on me. So I got beer on. They're trying to pour it on me from up top. You know what I'm saying? Like the top part of the balcony. Yeah. And Charles McCarthy tries to jump up and, like, rip the guy off the balcony because, you know, he's trying to protect me, me, you know. So yeah. I'm already fired up, but that just got me more fired up. Like, I'm going to F this kid up so bad, dude. Like, there's, you know, all these – and I didn't even know what they were saying. They were screaming at me in Spanish, but I knew they weren't saying good things. And, you know, that kind of got me a little bit extra hype, but it doesn't matter, man. You know, I, I have tunnel vision when I walk out there, and I have the same thing. Like, I, when I'm going in there, like, not – you know, like I said, I mean, you can tell, talk to me. Everyone says I'm a nice guy, but – there's a switch that I do that I flip, you know, when I flip the switch, like it's on, you know, and uh, I get tunnel vision. I don't see anything. I just look at my opponent and I'm looking at him like, that's all I see. And, you know, I do that Mike Tyson thing. Like I remember watching that video when I was like maybe, you know, 13, 14 years old about how he looks for the twitch in their eye. I literally do that. Like I don't take my eyes off him and, and I'm going, and that's just gives me my free, my full confidence, you know? And which, so when you were a kid, did that, did that start when you were a kid? I mean, if you have two older brothers, you know, yeah. most guys that have two older brothers get their asses kicked by their older brothers. Is that, is that where that kind of started? Sure. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. I, I, my whole friggin' childhood was grew up me just trying to get away from my brothers whooping my ass. But, you know, luckily I have two younger brothers too, Lucas and Francis. My brother Lucas, Rosa, just moved down from Boston. Uh, and also I have a sister, Teresa. 
Uh, but my brother Lucas just moved down from Boston. You know, he's a, uh, from New Hampshire. He's a state champion wrestler in New Hampshire. So he wants to pursue this fighting thing full time. So that's pretty cool. So, you know, I really like to think I come from a fight family. If you ever meet my dad, you can tell he's a, he's a bruiser himself. He's a beast of a man. And, uh, you know, my uncle Tom the Bomb Rosa, you know, over 200 boxing fights. So I just, you know, it's pretty cool. So yeah, you also sorry Matt, you're also a chef too, which I'm fascinated with because yeah. I we've talked to a lot of guys that do a lot of different jobs, like you know, but a lot of times they're bouncers or they're, I don't think I've talked to a professional chef who's a fighter yet. What what made you go into that? Yeah, I mean that's what I wanted. To, I mean that's uh, that's what I do. I mean, I mean I went to I mean that's what I went to school for. I got my degree in culinary arts. I graduated from Johnson and Wales and uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, but. Pretty much after after high school, like, you know, you have to be meeting with the guidance counselor at the end when I went to high school in Boston and they're like, oh, you know, what do you want to do when you what do you want to do after call after high school? And I'm like, I don't know, I want to play hockey. And they were like, Well, you can't play hockey. And I'm like, well, why not? I want to be in the NHL. Like, eh, you know what I mean? And it's just kind of just it wasn't like, I mean, I wasn't the best hockey player in the world, but I was like, that's what I wanted to do. And they're like, Well, what else do you like to do? And kind of sarcastically, I was like, Well, I like to eat, I love food, I come from a large Italian family, like my mom and dad have each each have eight brothers and sisters. So ever since I was a little kid, I can remember rolling meatballs in the kitchen with my dad and my mom. And dad. So <laughs> that's how I grew up. So I always was cooking, always eating, like always food on the table, you know. And uh, so I loved cooking. So I was like, oh, I love eating. And then the lady was like, oh, I kind of said it like sarcastic. But she was like, oh, why don't you go to the school, Johnson & Wales? It has a hockey team and they have a culinary program. And I was like, hey, wow. best of both worlds. So that's what I did. And I, you know, luckily was able to pull out of it, graduate through a lot of shit, but you know, and, uh, I'm happy I did cause it helps a lot with my fight diet and my nutrition and all that stuff. Oh, right. Yeah, you know, I ended up getting a great job down here. I worked at a five-star restaurant, like cut 432, a five-star steakhouse in South Florida was like, you know, it's like a real restaurant. And then I learned how to cook there too. So, uh, it's my other passion, but fighting is my number one, you know? Nothing better than a good steak. Like, you know, I've gotten it. Like, you ever go to a Michelin place, and some of them are great. Oh. Then they have these weird, this is an egg with cinnamon. Fuck you. Yeah. Like, it's just not good. Okay. Well, it's all quality, man. That's what people always like. Oh, man. Like, people haven't come over. Like, I've been to different places. You know, I've even been to, a, you know, a Wonder Boy's house. I went over there, lived at his house for a little while. I cooked them oh. like, trim scampi dinner. You can ask, you know, Ray Thompson or, 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 oh, or, shit. Uh, or, or them about that. I, you know, amazing family they are. And stuff like that but you know I, I went there and cooked for them and stuff like that but sometimes i'll go to like my friends houses and they're like hey man you gotta cook you're a chef like what can you make and i'm like all right well what do you want to make and i'll look in the cabinet and they get like mac and cheese and like canned tuna <laughs> like bro i can't do anything with this like you need fresh ingredients like you can't just make magic out of nothing so there is you know i can definitely make things better but it's all about the fresh ingredients and stuff like that and getting the right stuff were you were you training with wonder boy at the time you were out there training yeah that was yeah it was about five or six years ago probably I, before i was in the ufc so i saw some sidekicks that's why i'm asking yeah yeah that's where i learned it from uh you know ray taught me ray and steven they taught me a lot man they were treating me like family lived at their house for a little bit i i developed their style i used their style and you know i i mean i used it because one time i got dropped in a fight I, I won the fight but it was like i got dropped and i'm like man i gotta get rid of this 50 50 fighting like i just come in every time and if i fight like this 10 times like eventually one time you're going to lose and we can't afford that if I want to be the champion, you know? So, cause I was like the best amateur in the country. I was fought 20 amateur fights. I was like 19, I was like 18, you know, like unbelievable records. So like one time I got dropped, I got up and I, like, I won the fight, but I was like, man, like we can't ever let that happen again. So at that time, Charles McCarthy was managing, uh, Stephen Thompson. And he's like, Hey, I got this guy, man. Like he's the most elusive, like best stand up guy in the world. And I was like, a karate guy is the best guy in the world. Bro, I went and trained with Steven Thompson. And there's no doubt, like he is the best stand-up guy on the planet Earth. Like, you know, <laughs> how's 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 Ray Thompson as an instructor? Oh, I can see him being a little stern. He's a legend. He's a legend, dude. That guy is a legend. Like you say, yes sir. You call him Mr. T or yes sir. That's all you. You know, you respect him like a father right away. Like he just has that composure, and he's a special dude. He's good. He's good entertainment too. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, we had some fun you know? times, no doubt. <laughs> we had a little thing about Kimo's ponytail. Might have That's been. right. And you were right, Matt. I watched the I, fight. You were I, right. Well, he thought he got the hair pulled out because it's like an old, like, uh, sail. Uh, what is it? Like an old. Um, it's like, like a like, bun? It, no, it was, it was a. No, he had a top knot, is what he had. Oh. And then uh, every, a lot of people were saying he got pulled out because Hoist, back in the day, you were allowed to pull hair in the UFC. Oh, yeah. oh, so Hoist had it. Oh, this is UFC number three. So, I mean. <laughs> This is when it was NHB, not MMA, you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you had him by the, uh, 
like a top knot. And he was like hit, working him from his guard, always. And people are saying he got pulled out because you saw something black on the mat, but it was the fucking mouthpiece. It so was. Like, he's so great. I'm like, remember when you brought that up? He's like, yes. I go, well, you. I, I think you were wrong. He's like, you are mistaken. I'm like, oh! <laughs> yeah, you don't mess with Mr. T. You don't talk back to Mr. T. Not even a kid to do that. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's so great, man. But, uh... What else was I going to say? You were right, but I probably won't tell him that the next time he's on. I'll probably forget about this and just – but I watched the fight right after that interview, and I'm like, yeah, Matt was right. That was a mouthpiece. And they, and they even said there was a mouthpiece on the, on the, on the uh, Yo, so one other thing I was going to uh, – uh, like I don't think I saw it yet, but I'll probably go back and watch it because I just I just subscribed to this uh, podcast thing. But uh, I, I, what was uh, Bryce Mitchell saying? He was talking He was talking to it or – Oh, Bryce Mitchell just pissed off. off. Right, he was pissed off that he said he's like I don't I don't know why he's talking. Uh, we already had the fight, and he's just talking shit. He said he's gonna break my arm, and it really annoyed him. Like, like the fact he took that very personal. Oh, here's what he, he said, right, Matt? He said he felt like it was bullying. He's like it reminded him of when he was younger, and people would talk shit to him, like, so it tapped into something he didn't like. It was like, why would you tell somebody you don't even know you're gonna break his damn arm? That type of thing. What <laughs> are listen, we doing? I mean, what are we doing? Hey, you know? everybody's gotta use whatever they need yep. to get themselves mentally straight to get locked in a cage with somebody. Yeah. You understand? That's how I feel. So I when I hear, like, my whole attitude was, listen, I have enough friends that could use some enemies. I'm in the fight game. Fuck it. Like, you know what I mean? Because yep. it does suck compared to, like, we talked about this the lab. We talked about this with Bryce Mitchell, which was, I've had opponents that I like. Because when you live in a house, it's hard not to like somebody. Yeah, so I really, yeah, the, yeah. me and Chris Lytle, we got really yeah, yeah, you, fought him for the, you fought him for the championship, I, right? And I fought him for the, 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 yeah, for the, and we were both um in the house together on the tough yeah, horse. We fought yeah, for, the for the tough championship, yeah. So, and it was like a really close, uneventful fight, you know. Uh, yeah, and I get, It was 30-27, 30-27, 30-27. Uh, two for me, one for him. So it was really weird, you know what I mean? Yeah. Was, you know? And it really could have went either way, you know. But then, you know, anyway, oh, what the fuck? Oh, oh so we got really close. I had to fight him again. Yeah, after that, it went great. But uh, then, uh, and then I had to fight him again, like for my last fight. And it just, oh, you got your if, yeah, we, I lost that one. And that was a better, it was more of a scrap of just throwing. I don't know. I should have went for it. Listen. I should have done my jiu-jitsu. I should have tried. He's not, he's not easy to tap, but I should have fucking added a takedown, Charles. Learn from my mistakes. But anyway, the point is, I fight a guy like that I really like. It is, it's a, you're still competing, and it doesn't make you fight less. But getting there, when you got a guy that you can't lose to, or a guy that says anything, even if you don't know, he says a remark that you don't like, it's like, I, it, your pride steps in. And it's like, you know what? I'm not fucking losing the Frank Trigg. I'm not losing the fucking Matt Hughes. Yeah. Fuck those guys. Fuck them. Yeah. Well, that's what I want. <laughs> I want the bike. That's the, that's the shit. That's the angriest Bryce Mitchell I can get. So whatever I got to say to get him there and, you know, whatever I do to get myself there, it's, uh, you know, I want the fight that the fans are expecting. You know what I'm saying? And again, man, he was in yeah. that, I watched his fight with Bobby Moffitt, and he was in some tight-ass Darce jokes, and yeah, he's that's the fight I really watch if you want to see his medal. You want to see what he's made of. Yeah, and I'm I was, like, all right, this kid, you know, was a self, like a nice – Talks like a nice southern boy, like oh, you know, yeah, all I mean, polite. But he's got it, man, too. So this fight, when I started, when I had, when we were gonna have him on, I started going back watching your fights. I'm like, holy fuck, this should be talked about. This fight, yeah. you know what I mean? Because I'm yeah. fucking, I'm. The whole card is is excellent. It's but, the opening fight on the card. Huh? You guys are the opening fight, right? Yeah, yeah, we're opening, man. It's, it seems like it's gonna be historical. They're saying it's gonna be the first major sporting event to happen since the pandemic. So I'm really hoping it happens. I'm ready for it to happen it's i'm you know pretty cool that we're gonna be the first ones first ones on since all this madness you know all right listen enough for all this fight stuff i want to ask you something uh i know you're tight with charles mccarthy my god he he is a ranked virtual reality pavlov player do you know this about your well i didn't even really know it until like the last like year and he tell me you do this and i go over his house and he put me on his virtual reality thing and i was like this is crazy like why don't i have one of these and it was like the coolest thing i'm like i can't believe like everyone doesn't have one it's the best thing ever it's like real world like you put it on and you're on another planet but then recent until recently the last year this this new restaurant opened up where it's like a virtual reality they have a restaurant and uh like it's like a whole thing and i met all of his teammates and we had dinner together and like they set up all the vr and stuff and like really amazing people and like 
it was just they were like, you know how good Charles is? He's like one of the best in the world. I'm like, are you serious? Like, yeah, our team won the championship of like the whole world in VR. And I was like, I, you know, Charles is a humble guy, so he doesn't go around bragging how smart he is and how good he is at VR and how good he is at all this stuff he is. But man, I, I really think Charles McCarthy is like a genius, man. Like, you just don't say, it. you know, he's he's really good. He's an amazing teacher, you know, jujitsu and his VR. Like, for what his teammates were saying, I looked them up, they're all legit. Like, that, you it's know, funny. What, what do you, do? you must be good at it. I, you know, and I was talking to him the other day about it, and he's a humble guy, but again, we're close. Yeah. So he plays the game Pavlov. The geeks are like this, Jimmy. I don't want. Don't yeah. think we're losing people. <laughs> the geeks right now are getting hard. Listen. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so I like standout battle royale. That's what I like. It's like yeah, PUBG. Yeah. He likes more like a Counter Strike in VR. It's like. Yeah. So listen, man. I'm not shitting on his game. So all of a sudden he goes, standout is done. And I go, wait. I thought he meant dope because I thought there was a typo. So yeah. he's shitting on my game. Oh, there's more bots than plays. And I go, oh, McCarthy, you better chill, man. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, I go, look, man, fuck your game. You're on there two seconds, you get killed. No strategy. There's yeah. no fucking strategy, Charles. Charles, Charles is a good there's no strategy. Yeah. And he starts arguing with me, no, but you got your squad, this strat is strategic. Yeah. I go, and I didn't listen. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let the world know now. You drop me and Charles McCarthy in a standout battle royale setting. Last man standing. I'm sorry to get dark with you right there. No, well, the only way to, the only way to know is when it happens. So let's do it. All right. I'm sorry. We're back now. I just had to air that out. We can always cut that out of the interview. No, it's, we should do it. No, it's a challenge. It's got. It's got to stay in, Matt. You can't cut that. I like my. Gotta get it out. Vent it out. All right. Look, Charles, uh, we're happy you came on, and it was fu- it was fun talking to you, man. And uh, I'm really, really psyched for this fight. The entire card is amazing. Even though Amanda unfortunately dropped out. Yeah. Uh, exactly. yeah. yeah, I mean, Dominic Cruz, to see Dominic fighting again uh, is fantastic. And uh, good luck with it, man. It's, uh, it's a great card, and everybody is going to be watching it. Because even people who aren't necessarily UFC fans are probably going to watch it because people are home and they're looking for sports. So uh, there's going to be a lot of eyes on you. Awesome, man. I appreciate it, man. It's awesome. You know, thanks for having me on the show. Good stuff. I might like, like, I just wanted to shout out one thing. I just, you know, if you guys want to follow any of my, my, my uh, cooking stuff for my Instagram, you know, it's Charles Rose MMA on Twitter. I post like latest fight updates or things that's going on in the fight. And I always got like some cooking stuff that I'm doing on there. So you can check that out. And then you can also check out my family's charity, uh, Chucky's fight.com. Uh, it's a family charity. My mom and dad started, uh, to help knock out substance abuse. So, you know, my dad goes in the water. He lives up in Boston, it's freezing cold. He jumps in the freezing cold ocean every oh, wow. morning to help raise money to help knock out substance abuse. So you guys can go on there, donate, or you can just go in there and watch my crazy dad jump in the water when it's snowing every morning. So, Hey, did you avoid, by the way, before we let you go, did you avoid that road because of the road your brothers went down? Did you kind of stay away or did you almost go down that road or, or did, did you, did that kind of keep you away? Yeah, I mean, it kept me away a little bit, but I mean, it was it was tough, man. It wasn't easy because you know at that time I was 16 and 17. Yeah, those years of your life, out, you know, I was I was a pretty bad kid, but I was able to turn things around and you know happy where I'm at now, and I you know help a lot of people and uh, you know try to be good now. You know what I'm saying? Good man. Let me, good. Let me tell you, Charles. Uh, you, you know your family. It seems like it, it's seen a lot of tragedy, but uh, not only the way you fight, the way you carry yourself. I'm sure you're making everybody very proud in your family. I appreciate that, man. All right, man. Thanks, Thanks Charles. Thanks for coming Thanks out with us. Yeah. with us, man. Yeah, Thanks, good luck in the fight. Yeah, I'm a coffee. I'm fucking coming for him in the oh, fucking dude. VR. I'm <laughs> coming for him. You let him know. All right, I'll let him know. I'll let him know. Later, guys. All right, Charles. All right, see you later, man. All later, right. buddy. Boston Strong. Uh, what a, a nice kid. guy. What a nice kid, no? Yeah, yeah. Really nice dude. I didn't uh, know he was a chef, too, until today, and I started reading more. Uh, what an interesting combination. First of all, women must throw themselves at that dude. You can fight, and you're a chef. But, but, and, and he's good looking. He's good I have none kid. of those things. He's a good looking, well spoken kid. He's got, a, and, and he could, he could cook. He's a fucking badass. And, uh, it, this is one of the things. It took, it's, we have so many fights. He deserves some attention because, I mean, both him and, and if you look at his opponent, Bryce Mitchell, uh, it's going to be a great fucking fight. And I just want, it's always better when people know a little bit more. About the fighter. Agree. You, you watch this kid's fight. You go to fight UFC fight pass. You put in Charles Rosa. You're not going to have a bad fight. I mean, I wanted just to watch the last fight. Then I watched the fight before. And then I, I ended up watching like at least three or four of his fights. So he's uh, he's really entertaining. 
And uh, this fight with Bryce Mitchell is a perfect matchup to bring out the best skills in both guys. But you're right, Matt. When when you interview people or you listen to people talk, you get a little invested in them because there's so many fighters. There's so many guys. But when you get to know somebody a little bit or you you get to hear them talk and you see what their life is, then you're a little more invested in watching them fight. Whether you like them or dislike them doesn't matter. You become more invested in watching them fight because you've learned something about them. I mean, Jimmy, he lost two of his siblings. I never knew that. I didn't know know that. Yeah. I mean – that's, I mean, I mean, and look what he's doing, man. He really is at making his uh, his whole family proud. He looks like, a, you know, such a great, he looks like a really nice kid, you know. The great Dan Hardy. How are you guys? All here. Look at that fucking hair this guy has. Look at it, Jimmy. It's an incredible head of hair. Do I sound jealous of his hair? <laughs> oh, you sound complimentary. You know, that's no. How are you, Dan? You are. Huh? Huh? I can cut some off and send it to you if you like. Dan, how you been, man? How are Good. you, dude? Good. I haven't, seen, haven't, haven't seen you in a minute. That's a long time. A long, That's how the kids fall. time. Yeah. How are things with you? Things are good, man. Things are good. I mean, we're in a fucking quarantine. How, tell me a day in the life for Dan Hardy in quarantine. Yeah, where are you? Uh, I'm I'm in England. I'm at home in England. Um, I, I live in a small village in the Midlands, so it's it's quiet around here anyway. So it doesn't feel too different, to be honest. And I'm I'm pretty antisocial. I like to stay at home, so I, I don't mind it too much. You're antisocial. I didn't get that vibe when I when I hung out with you a fucking decade ago <laughs> when you fought GSP. Uh, Jimmy Norton, do you know that this man went five rounds with GSP in his prime? I do. Okay, I just want the world to know. <laughs> because new, hey, listen, new, we all know, you know, this is a radio thing. All, and you know, the new kids who are watching UFC, they're like, oh, the guy with the funny hair who does, he's really good as an analyst. But they don't know that, that Dan Hardy's a fucking beast. Yeah, but, or maybe yeah, they but do. you know. And, and I'll tell you something else as well. There's a reason I, I managed to go five rounds with him, and that was the training I did with you, my friend. Uh, the, those those sessions that we did on the mats in your school prepared me for those five rounds better than anything else. Oh, that's just, I love that plug. I wish my schools were running. I'd fucking run with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had some, hey, listen, we had a good time, though. We really did. You came down with a few of your buddies, uh, and we had a, we had a good time. Me, you, Longo, we had some laughs, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we did. We did. And it was just, it was exactly what I needed, because, you know, morale was kind of low at the time. I just lost my grandfather, and it was just me and two other people out there, so... We kind of felt a little bit isolated, and then we got connected up with you guys, and you you brought us in like family, and, and really helped me out. Now I thought you were living in Las Vegas or or on the West Coast somewhere. Where were you living? When did you yeah, move I back? Was, home? I, I was in California for a while, and then I moved to Vegas, and then uh, yeah. to, you know uh, around my last fight, probably about six months after my last fight, uh, which was I mean what's nearly seven years ago now, maybe even wow. seven years ago. Um, I moved back to the UK, um, and I've been here ever since. Uh, I, I bought a, an old, an old building, an old church building, and uh, I'm just kind of working on it and slowly <laughs> building on it. And I've got a wicked gym in this place. It's awesome. Yeah. So what happened? You were homesick, or you just missed the fucking gloom of the UK? You, you LA was. I mean, West Coast was too sh- sunshine and fucking. What happened? You missed home? <laughs> Why'd you leave? You know what? You know what? I, I loved it. I always did. I, I do love California, and I will live there again at some point for a period of time. And Vegas as well was a lot of fun. Um, but you know what it's like. Fa- families, family's the most important. And and right now, I can be at my parents' house in thirty minutes. Same with my sister and my grandparents. Um, you know, so it's it, it's. Plus, you know, I, I'll be honest. I like I like the UK. I like the climate here. I like the uh, you know, and and I'm, I'm working for the UK for the UFC in Europe most of the time as, as well. So yeah. it saves a lot of air travel. You're yeah. great behind the mic too. You must like a lot of guys. The fighting have no idea what what they're gonna do. For you, it just seems to be kind of a natural uh, progression, and you still get to be around it, and it's still kind of your life. That's got to feel good. Well, I've always had too much to say for myself. I think that's always helped. Um, and, and I've, I've never been particularly particularly talented at anything when it comes to martial arts. So I've always had to learn everything. I've always had to go through each step and learn every technique, you know, make sure that, you know, make sure it was correct. Otherwise, it just wouldn't work for me. Like, you know, one of my teammates, Paul Daly, had wicked power in his hands, you know, and, and like it was it almost seemed effortless for him to knock people out. Whereas I had to make sure my timing was right, my technique was right. So I think I was just able to kind of, you know, 
learn the mechanics of things, and that's transferred quite well. Um, and plus, you know, I'm, I'm a huge I'm a huge MMA fan. You know, I, I just love learning, so it's it's easy for me to be, be obsessive about uh, you know a fighter or a fight card, or you know, if I'm researching for inside the octagon, to spend a couple of days just watching two fighters and how they're going to face off. I mean, that's uh, that's the dream job for me. Now, uh, I'm sorry, Jimmy. Uh, okay. At thirty at, at thirty seven, you're not old by any means. You know, uh, you know there was talk about you possibly having one more. more. I know you. I remember hearing that. Were you saying that somewhere? Uh, is that is that talk done? Because I know you had a little bit of health issues. I don't know exactly what it was. Something with your heart. Uh, is, is any more talk about coming back, or you're just done with that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm always. <laughs> I'm I'm always kind of ticking over. I'm always training, and it never leaves that itch to fight. I don't know how you feel, Matt, but it, it never leaves. I, I I you know every time I'm sitting octagon side watching these guys, uh, part of me is a little bit jealous because I'd love to be in there experiencing that that adrenaline rush again. Um, you know, and if the time's right and the opponent's right, then at some point I, I would step back in there. Um, I'd have to I'd have to make sure I was prepared for it though, and I'm you know I'm, I need to pick up my training a little bit more. But this, this, there are too many things going on at the moment. Towards the end of last year, when I was trying to get some consistent training together, I was at most events. And then this year started, I had two two events to go to, one over in New Zealand, one in Brazil, and then lockdown started. So I'm just kind of ticking over at home now. What else it's do you do? Thing. You said you bought a building. Oh, sorry, Matt. What, what, you bought a building. What are you doing with it? And what are you going to do inside the uh, – what, what is the building for? Well, it's it's an old uh, church building. It was, uh, it was built in 1895. Um, so it's, you know – I mean, when I moved in, it had the original roof on it with, you know, no insulation. It was just slate tiles on on wood. Um, so I've had to have, I've had to do a lot of work just to kind of update it, um, you know. But it's getting to the stage where I can start, you know, converting the loft. I've put my I've installed a gym in in one of the one side of the building. So like anyone that follows me on Instagram can see me working out in my gym, hitting my bag. That's that's in my house. That's I had a big training rig built in my house. This is my office, which. I'm not sure whether you can see it's full of Lego. Oh, you're a Lego guy. I just yeah. bought one for the first time in years about a week ago because I might want to do a Lego. Which are, are, Is that something you're – is like a hobby of yours? I, I've, had, I've had Lego for every birthday and Christmas since I was probably five years old. The, that, the Lego yeah. shit behind me, I've got one behind me with red sails. That was the first one I got. I got that one went, oh, for Christmas when I was five, and I've just collected I, now, ever since. What, I'm intru- now, this is fascinating to me. Tell me about – now – I had a big imagination as a kid. I'm kind of still a big kid. What is it with the Legos? Is it like a puzzle? Like, is it like somebody gets a grat? It's like, is it a, you get a satisfaction. 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 I got you it. notice why, Dan Hardy, this is why I'm a <laughs> podcast guy, not an analyst. Well, listen, you get like the same satisfaction as somebody doing a fucking puzzle? Or what? I don't understand. What is the, what is the thing with the Legos? I, I don't know what I don't know. I think it's different for a lot of people. For me, it was. I mean, when, when I was a kid, it, I was. I had, I've got a great imagination, so I was able to create things. I was able to kind of, you know, work out ideas in my head. With, you know, with the bricks. I mean, they, they kind of give you, you know, unlimited flexibility. And then they've got like the pirate sets and the castle sets and, you know, all the city sets. You can, you know, so depend. No matter what you like, you can buy something that you can build yourself. Uh, there's definitely a satisfaction to completing a set, and some, you know, I mean, they get more and more challenging. I've got one in the, in the other room at the moment that needs doing, which is the Millennium Falcon from oh. Star Wars. and that is, I mean, that's that's the biggest Lego set ever How made. How many up. pieces? It's about seven. I think that's about seven thousand pieces. Wow. Which is it, it, that's a lot. I mean, that's a, that's that's a thousand dollar set. That is, it's going to take me a while to build. It um, seems like work to me. <laughs> It's like, that's, I look at a puzzle and I like a big puzzle with all the million and you put it together and it gets a picture. The fuck? Really? This piece? <laughs> it, fuck off. I puzzles love the are different. I, a puzzle I like to do. How to get out of the fucking lockdown. And, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. I used to use it in training camp because it used to help me relax. Like if my brain was racing and I couldn't sleep. Like to get a Lego set out and just build it, like the the methodical process of going through the instructions and you know step by step putting it together. I I always find it quite relaxing. Um, Do you and, ever and take them apart? Accumulation, which I'm working through during lockdown. Do you ever take them apart and build other stuff out of just like two or three combined sets? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I mean, I've, I've got a few sets that I'm building up that I had from from childhood. I'm I'm building some castles today, actually. Um, 
So I'm putting them together today so I could display them. But I've got I've got a few sets I'll keep built and display, but then a lot of other sets that are just in pieces that, yeah. Because, you know, I have, I have friends who have got kids. They can come over and rummage through and build what they like. Oh, and, you, know. oh, you hey, let Jimmy. them touch your stuff. Okay, that's nice. Oh, yeah. Well, some of it. Let's not, let's not be crazy. Jimmy, not that you goof on me, but I think you kind of snickered about my love of Star Wars, Marvel movies, and comic books. Why don't you fuck with Dan Hardy with his love of Legos? Because oh! I... Yes! Hey, motherfucker! Look! <laughs> Look at this! Yes! <laughs> oh, Jimmy! Listen, what do you got? I, I, I like the first three Star Wars. After that, I can't stand it. But I, I just bought a Harry Potter fucking Lego, and I've never seen the movies. That's how bored I am. I went and bought a Harry Potter Lego castle just to have something to do. All right, listen, nice. fuck Legos for a second. You like Star Wars or no? <laughs> you like fuck Star Wars? Legos. <laughs> you ever watch Mandalorian? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. You watch Mandalorian? Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. absolutely. Oh, he hates them. No, that was sorry. I didn't realize you were talking to me because that's a foregone conclusion. It's Star Wars, of course. I've watched Mandalorian. I've watched I, it twice. I've got I've got all this all the Lego sets that have already been released. <laughs> I'm all how, over it. Hey, how great was that episode with his buddy Jimmy's buddy Bill Burr? How great was that episode? Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. And, and it's you know what? It's nice to see as well. Is you know these new Star Wars films coming out. A lot of the people that are, are having cameos in them, like Bill, are, are huge Star Wars fans. I mean, yep. you know, imagine getting the call up and, and, and them saying, hey, do you want to be, be in one of these Mandalorian episodes? And we're like, sign me up. Yeah, but, yeah, absolutely. I should have started with all this. Holy fuck. I hope you have some time. Listen, The, the Last Jedi. Uh, yay or nay with The Last Jedi? You know the one where with Luke dying at the fucking thing and he, he's oh, not really there? Thanks, Matt. Oh, fuck, Jimmy. Well, you don't even know what a fucking Ewok is. You don't watch anything. How dare you? But I hate the Ewoks. That turned me against the whole franchise. <laughs> I was like, I can't it watch it. It was age appropriate for me. I was little. I'm like, oh, look at little Wicked. Look at Anyway, I like the little song at the end. Did you like The Last Jedi? Out of the new movies, The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of the Skywalker. Thoughts, Stan Hardy. You know, I, I've enjoyed all of them. I, I'll be honest. I've enjoyed all of them. And and what I would expect from a you know from something Disney is they they the production is is awesome. That I actually I've been back and I've watched all of the Star Wars in this lockdown. And you know, I like the, the original trilogy obviously because there's something romantic about it. You know, there's a romanticism about watching them. And you know, I watched them back and I've been watching them. You know, with, with my girlfriend and she's kind of watching them, thinking, eh, these aren't very good to be honest. But like the nostalgia is is what we love about those movies. I think if you compare them to the new ones, you know they're not as not as watchable. I don't think. But then it was the it was when they went back and did one, two, and three. I, I that, that was that, that was where they lost me a bit. I didn't like those three. But then I got back on board with the other with the newer stuff that's come out. So, yeah. You didn't like when they took the really uh, the when the old remember the old uh, Darth Vader who looked like Donald Pleasance. Uh, you didn't like when they replaced him with the good looking young one when Lucas took out the original Darth Vader and then put the young handsome one. I hated him for that too. The original three, like the, the new three with uh, Jar Jar Binks and, and uh, yeah. they were terrible. <laughs> didn't like they that. were terrible. The only saving grace is the fight scene with Qui Jin and fucking. And uh, Obi Wan versus Darth Maul. Darth Maul was money, you know. They, they brought it back in the Clone Wars, but that's a cartoon. Let's not get too. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose a lot of fans. But listen <laughs> to me. Uh, the Last Jedi. I want to right now. Not it, it, this is not the the, the uh, view of the UFC or anybody involved in the entertainment business with us. And <laughs> this is not Jimmy's view. But can I give a big fuck you to Ryan Johnson for fucking up the whole new trilogy? Uh, hey. J.J. Abrams should have kept that thing from the get-go. Force Awakens was fun. Ryan Johnson comes in, Mr. Motherfucking Looper, which was great. I love Looper. I was excited for him to do this. Takes a shit on everything that J.J. Abrams did in the prior film. Gets rid of the mask. Oh, it's childish. Let's get rid of Snoke. He's nobody. Oh, Ray, you have no real background. You're a nobody. Fucking. Uh, oh. And then... Luke, Luke Skywalker, the most beloved, you know, arguably one of the most beloved, uh, iconic, heroic figures, Jedi yeah. Knight. It's going to murder his nephew in his sleep because he's worried about what, oh yeah, let me explain that to Leia and Han, you asshole. Fucking Ryan Johnson, uh, Dan Hardy, I I'm going to blame this on the mugs. I don't know what it is, but 
I'm upset. I, it brings, he fucking killed Luke. Luke could have went out like a space samurai. But instead, oh, we get that little, oh, he wasn't there. He doesn't have the footprints in the sand. Oh, fuck you, man. For, oh, he dies on a rock. Meditating. How come none of those guys die of he disease? He dies on a rock. Meditating. None Jimmy. of those guys get diabetes or cancer. How come nobody in the Star Wars universe just gets a disease like everybody else? He took a shit on everything he did, Jimmy. And right. then, and then, listen, the rise of the Skywalker. I enjoyed it. it. Was like a, it was like almost like a fucking fan film. They made it fun and whatever. He had to tr to unfuck himself from Ryan Johnson. But anyway, how did you get into analyst work? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm out of great at segways. <laughs> oh, beautiful. I'm gonna watch oh, those movies back later with your mind, with your mouth. You were okay. You were okay, yeah. okay with that, though, Dan. You were okay with him taking out Luke Skywalker on that fucking rock and yeah. not being there himself. I just try not to get too invested in these things these days. I, you know, I, yeah. I enjoy them for what they are. Half of the time, I'm shopping for, for Lego when, when I'm uh, when I'm watching them as well because I'm like, oh, I need that set. I need that set. You know, so. You trying yeah. to say I get, too, I get too worked up? He's saying yeah. you're too angry about it. Yeah, he just likes to play with Lego and can, enjoy a good movie. Can I? Can I? Can I do? I will say this though: The Mandalorian. Let's leave it on a good note with the Star Wars. John Favreau. What's the other guy that made the fucking thing? He made the Clone Wars cartoon and stuff. What's his name? He's 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 like partners with him in it. Oh man, I'm, I, I feel bad. Yet. What's I haven't his name? seen that. Good. Uh, well, I mean, but he's part of. Uh, I'm gonna get it. People are gonna DM me and say Kylo oh, Ren. No, stop it. No, he's one of the the directors. Oh. <laughs> he's one of the guys, the, the creators of the main. I hate War. him as a bad guy, by the way. Kylo Ren, fucking Kylo daddy Ren. issues. Yeah, uh. he had daddy issues. Han Solo, what a shitty ass father. <laughs> he took off. He took off with his buddy Chewbacca. Let's get out of here, man. Let's go run some fucking illegal shit. What the fuck? I don't know. Star Wars is great. I love Star Wars. But uh, The Mandalorian does bring it back to that nostalgic feel and whatnot. Yeah. So, yeah, Dan, how did you get into analyst work? That's a good yes. question. <laughs> <laughs> how you know did what? You? It was Dana White. It was it was Dana White who came up to me. I'd been into the uh, the old UFC offices on uh, on Sahara in Vegas. I just went in to have a, have a catch up with Lorenzo because, uh, you know, wanted to see how I was doing after being pulled from the fight. Um, how my health was and all that kind of stuff. And um, as I was leaving, Dana pulled up and uh, in a in a big stretch, Monster Energy drinks Hummer, as you would imagine, Dana would, yeah. and jumped out. And he was like, "I've got an idea. I want you to move back to the UK and you know, uh, work, you know, work commentary." So basically, it was like Dana took a, a big gamble on me. I, I'll always yeah. be thankful for it. Just kind of thought. You know, well, he, he's got a big mouth. He seems to be able to speak fairly well for himself. Let's see how he does in this role. And I did one trial run when, uh, who was it? Ronda Rousey fought Sarah McMahon. Daniel Cormier fought um, Patrick Cummins. I was octagon side for that, doing like a test run. And then the next next event was uh, UFC London. Um, and that was, that, that was it. I'd, I'd never done any commentary before. My first event was, was a UFC London. Was it nerve wracking your first time? Like, you know, how much do I say? When do I just let them fight? Like, was it hard to get that uh, that rhythm down of when to say something and when not to? It, it, it was a little bit, um, yeah. I mean, the, the, this challenge is always is always how you work with your with your co commentator. Um, and I was very fortunate. I got, I got John Gooden. Um, I'd done a couple of screen tests with a couple of guys, but John Gooden and I just clicked. Um, the challenge is obviously you're not you're not sitting facing each other when you're talking. You're having a conversation, both staring right. at the same thing. Uh, you know, so you, you can have a tendency to talk over one another and, and those kind of things. Plus, keeping an eye on the on the actual schedule. I mean, anybody that, that's worked behind the scenes of the UFC knows how well organized and, and timed everything is. Like, there are certain points where I have to basically shut my mouth because there's other stuff that needs to be going on. You know, adverts, commercials... You know, we need to hear what the corner team is saying. John's got to say something particular about something. There's loads going on. So I have to, you have to kind of tune in and get used to, you know, ha having a few streams of thought. As well as watching the fights, you've got someone talking in your brain. You're trying to pay attention to what your co-commentator is saying. It, it was a challenge. Um, but, you know, the thing is, I always make a joke out of this, but it, it is true. I got knocked out live on TV at the O2 Arena, co-main event in London. What's the worst that's going to happen now? I'm going to say something right. stupid, you know? 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna trip up the octagon and headbutt the corner post. Eh, you know, it, I, I'm, it doesn't matter anymore. People have already seen my mohawk waving side to side and me falling asleep on the canvas. I'm, I'm over so, it. It's yeah. so funny. It's so funny, Jimmy. It, as you say that, before I, I checked my, uh, I was, you know, like you do, I was checking my uh, iPhone, and on the UFC page, it's me getting knocked out by Shoney Carter with a back fist. That happened twenty fucking years ago, you assholes. But it's so funny. It's very freeing, Jimmy, when it gives you such an I don't give an f attitude when everybody's right. seen you at your most vulnerable and at your worst. It is really like, what else could you do to me? I don't look, look at that. Is that embarrassing? Yes. You know what I mean? But like you all, you know, so it is amazing when you, it does give you that outlook. I feel like that a lot when I'm doing the Dana White looking for a fight, when they have something for us to do, riding a bull, doing this and that. I'm like, dude, I've done it all, man. You know what I'm saying? I've, I've done, I've done like, done like, done like the, like the ultimate no thing that everything else, like after fighting in the cage, doesn't seem that scary. Right, Dan? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, th I think when you fall from such a great height, other things don't seem quite as high when you're going to fall, you know. <laughs> I fully, I, I remember watching. That. I'm, I'm going to go back and watch it and watch that fight again because I remember watching that fight around the time it happened. I don't think I watched it live, but I remember watching you hit the canvas and you you still had a look at an expression of like consciousness on your face, like you were aware of what had happened, like looked up at him, like ah. Like, it was so clear. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. so tough. If you watch it, just, you know what you do? Don't watch the last 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> talk about, Jimmy, talk about tripping at the finish line. That's but, all right. Uh, it, was, it was, listen, it happens, and I'll tell you the tunnel vision I had in there, how exhausted I was with my very first UFC fight, uh, and then, and then uh, just not having a fight go past the first round. Back in the day, Dan, there was no way to get, like, experience. So I had eight, like, fights locally. They stuck me on these little cards. Why would just take guys down and smoke them like a joint? They didn't know any jujitsu. So even the toughest guys who were, like, some judo guys or Sam guys, I'd still take them out. So I'm fighting a Shoney Carter who's not the best guy, but he had such experience. How was your very first thing? Do you remember your first time fighting in the octagon, and how did that feel? Yeah, it was, uh, it was UFC 89. I was fighting Akihiro Gono. Um, so the good thing was I knew exactly who I was fighting because he was an old pride veteran. You know, he already had wins over like Hector Lombard and Gegard Musassi. So I was aware of him. I was, you know, and I always preferred, you know, it's, it, it, in MMA it works the same. Better the devil you know. I'd much rather be fighting a guy I know is tough than be fighting John Jones making his UFC debut and I've never heard of the guy before. You know, I, I'd much rather. So I was quite, I was quite glad I knew who I was fighting and I respected him. I knew what he was capable of. Um, the weird thing was, at every fight leading up to the UFC, I remember feeling those nerves, those like, oh, like, why am I doing this uh, moments? And, you know, like, well, this is the last time I'm never doing this again kind of, kind of conversations going on in my head. The first time that didn't happen was my UFC debut. And I think that the reason in hindsight is because my goal was always to get to the UFC. I always wanted to, to step into the octagon, and when I was when I was behind the curtain, ready to make that first walk, it was like I'd already achieved my goal. Like I, I'd arrived. Like this was, you know, I'd, the thing is, I needed to readdress my goals and set them a little bit higher after that point because I'd already achieved that one. My my goal was to get to the UFC, and once I was there, I enjoyed that moment, that process. I was fortunate enough to get the win, and then uh, after that after that event, I remember driving home thinking to myself. Okay, that that was a weird experience, but I need to I need to refocus now and start thinking about the world title. It's funny how even with a bunch of fights, each fight is its own unique experience. Whether it's from the camp you put in to just where it is, the the walkout, it, it's familiar, but it's different all the same. If that makes any kind of sense, Dan? No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I can, and I've got a lot of my fights um, on video. <clears throat> and um, when I go back and watch them, and I've got the same thing with old playlists as well, because music was always a big part of my training camps. I always used to have like particular playlists I would listen to during training camp, and it would it would kind of anchor memories in those songs. So like there are certain playlists that I can put on now mm. that will take me back to my time fighting in Japan. And I remember sitting on the bus with those little white, you know, like <laughs> bits of paper on the back of the seats and. Everyone's asleep around me. I've got this music playing in my head. I'm looking at Tokyo as I'm driving to the airport. You know, it brings up a lot of those memories. 
And every, you said every single one of those fights, you could kind of, you could encapsulate it as like a, like an episode of a, you know, it's, it, it's its own story that the process of going there, of preparing for it, the people that you encountered when you were there, you know, so, uh, you remember the old days as well, where you'd show up with a man and pick up somebody else. You know, I remember those like fighting in Japan, I'd meet somebody in the dressing room and have them to corner me. So I'd, I'd have two guys in my corner instead of just one. Like, and their relationships that uh, that that I think, you know, they they they're they're the they're the, they're the special nuggets alongside the, the victories. I think. Dan, you're uh, you're freezing up just mad. You're freezing up just a little bit. I'm not sure if it's the connection. We caught what you were saying, but just so you know, you're just freezing up just a bit, uh-huh. a, a little bit. Or is it on my end, Matt? Can you hear that or is it? On no, my no, I froze up a little bit. I didn't want him to not get his point across. But, uh, but- I got the nuggets you're saying about the people he's beaten. <laughs> Uh, how did you get I'm sorry Jimmy I was going to ask how oh, you no. got into the uh, the listen what, it's the listen, listen podcast yes, but that's what I was going to mention him and Mark Goddard yeah yeah well that, that was I mean I've known him for a long time uh, I think he's refereed about 14 of my fights and uh, he's always got a lot to say for himself he's a very smart intelligent guy and you know, I, I don't think we hear him the officials in the sport I think there are certain times when judges and, and referees you know need to have a say um and it, it makes sense for, for us to record some of the conversations we have because they're fascinating. And plus, I kind of like wind, winding Mark up a little bit. I like, I like teasing him and you know, getting him a bit, a bit agitated because he's very entertaining when he's angry. <laughs> All right, well, listen, uh, it's always good talking to you. And the podcast, just so people know, is called Listen with Dan Hardy and Mark Goddard. And, um, you know, thanks for coming on. It's always uh, always good to hear you. And you're really a, such a great announcer. I mean, it's it's definitely uh, – you're in the right place. I'm so happy Thank to you, Dan. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. As you know, as you know Dan – as you know, Dan Hardy, there's a lot of tragedies in this fucking sport. Guys, after they're done fighting – you don't. Not only you don't hear from them, just you don't. They, they don't. It's not great for them. You're one of the guys that uh, you know. I'm really. I'm proud of. If that sounds weird. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. You played a part in that, and I, I'll be forever grateful for it. Thanks so much, Dan. All our best, good, brother. Good talking to you, Dan. Yeah, I tell you, the whole interview was great, though. Only at yeah. the end, this, a little choppy. You yeah, know? it happens. I wasn't sure if it was on my end or not. Like sometimes, you know, my signal coming in might be a little bit. But uh, listen, thank you to Charles uh, Rosa, and thank you so much to Dan Hardy. This was a fun one. It really was, Jimmy. And uh, you're right. Spock might not be great in bed. Who knows? Well, that was me who said that. You said that. I said he's probably terrific. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, great to disagree. And can I just say for the record, satisfied is a pretty sad, it's, it's an easy word. I said satisfied. 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 You got it. It's a very easy word, Jimmy. I what sometimes is, my mind goes places, and it, 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 you know, word? you bring Which me back. Word? What did I say? Satisfied? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's a I simple word. I'm not a moron, is what I'm telling you. I was just not at all. my right. mind goes places, and it comes back. Jimmy, I'm so happy we do this. Uh, so- what do you want to plug? Where are you going to be this weekend? I'm fucking. I'm going to be in the house at the table. Uh, you can go to youtube.com slash chip chipperson. There are two new chip podcasts up for anybody that cares. Any of my dates go to my website. They've been rescheduled. And uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you before the weekend, Matt. Definitely, Jimmy. Talk to you soon, buddy. Good time, yes. pal. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Charles. And I'll see you soon. Later, pal. All right, pal. Bye, everybody.